Hello, and welcome to part five of our lecture series on digestive system, where we're going to take a look at uh, the glands associated with the digestive system. Now, the first glands, and we uh, indicated this uh, in uh, the second lecture in this series, uh, the first glands that we're going to talk about are going to be the salivary glands. And the salivary glands are going to be a collection of glands that are going to be found in and around the oral cavity, which are going to be involved with releasing their secretions into the oral cavity to essentially help to moisten the food, help to lubricate the food, as well as to start that uh, digestion process. And so we're going to have the parotid salivary gland uh, sitting to the back of the oral cavity, the sublingual salivary gland uh, essentially sitting underneath the tongue, and the submandibular uh, salivary glands essentially sitting underneath the, the mandibular bone. Uh, if we take a look at the cells associated with the salivary glands, like other types of secretory regions we've seen within the body, we're going to have either serous cells, serous cells are small basophilic cells, which are involved with producing a protein-rich secretion. Uh, so we get uh, basophilic staining appearance because of the rough endoplasmic reticulum uh, being present there, relatively watery secretion. We're going to have mucus secreting cells, larger cells, which may have uh, an acidophilic or paler staining appearance, uh, which are going to be involved with producing mucus, as an example of a thick glyco glycosaminoglycan-rich secretion, uh, a few myoepithelial cells, and we may have structures where we have a mixture of both serous and mucus cells of ha having a serous demilume, so a combination where we have serous cells in one region surrounded by, towards the base, uh, some of these mucus secreting cells. Now, within the parotid salivary gland, we're essentially going to be looking at a structure involved with about 25% of the total salivary volume. And this parotid salivary gland is exclusively serous secreting cells, so ex exclusively these cells with the basal base of filia, and so uh, nucleus towards the bottom portion of the cell, uh, lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum in the middle third of the cell, and then secretory granules towards the apex of the cell. Secretory granules are going to be uh, carrying things like amylase, amylase, uh, sialomucin. Uh, they're going to be secreted within this area. We're also going to see underlying our uh, serous secreting cells, our epithelial cells, uh, lots of plasma cells, and the plasma cells are going to be involved with secreting IgA. This is a form of antibody that can be released across the epithelial lining. So it has the potential to get into the saliva, get into the mixture of the food particles there, and in essence, tag foreign materials at that point before they even get into the body. Within the submandibular salivary gland, uh, essentially we're looking at a mixed gland where we've got serous and mucus secreting cells. So we can see some serous demilumes uh, in this location. The submandibular salivary gland is about 70% of the total salivary volume. And it's going to have overall a relatively weak amylase activity. Uh, so breaking down of, of some sugars, uh, as well as some lysozyme activity. So some antibacterial effects uh, associated with that. And then finally, we've got the sublingual salivary gland. Uh, the sublingual salivary gland is a mixed mucus and serous gland but it's primarily mucus. The majority of the cells are going to be these pale uh, mucus secreting cells, and they're going to be, uh, again, mucus secreting, so they're going to be uh, producing mucus, uh, and it's going to comprise about 5% of the total salivary uh, volume. So in addition to the salivary glands, which are going to be released at the, the opening of the oral cavity, the opening of our digestive system, we're also going to have two relatively large glands uh, associated with providing the materials for the digestion of these food particles. But those, the pancreas and the liver, are going to be dumping their materials into uh, the digestive tract at the level of the duodenum. And so they're essentially going to be adding their materials into the small intestine after the materials have been processed and that uh, chemical breakdown has been occurring within the stomach. If we take a look at the pancreas, we're going to see that it's primarily a serous secreting gland. Uh, so it's going to have a serous appearance, so it's going to resemble our parotid, uh, parotid salivary gland. The difference, though, is that we're going to have these clusters of pale endocrine secreting cells, hormone secreting cells, within the islets of Langerhans. And in the image to uh, the right on the slide, 
we've got the pale staining islets of Langerhans, and then we have the serosecreting cells, the digestive enzyme secreting cells, kind of scattered around it. The majority of the cells, the serous cells within the pancreas, are going to be involved with secreting digestive enzymes uh, when they're triggered by the intraendocrine cells, the hormones released by uh, the cells within the small intestine. They're going to dump their digestive enzymes into a duct system, and then so their exocrine glands. They're going to dump their, their products into a duct system that's going to deliver these digestive enzymes into the duodenum. So if we take a look at this, the exocrine portion of the pancreas, again, the portion associated with the duct system, are going to be these pancreatic gas in our cells. And so primarily pyramid-shaped cells, epithelial lining cells, which are uh, essentially characterized by that basal basophilia that we keep talking about. Nuclei rounder towards the base of the cell, lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum at that middle region of the cell, and then they're going to have cytoplasmic granules towards the apex. These are often referred to as zymogen granules, where we're essentially storing the inactive enzymes. We're going to be producing enzymes that can break down proteins, that can break down lipids, that can break down carbohydrates, and break down nucleic acids. So in essence, we're producing the enzymes. These pancreatic acids in our cells are producing the enzymes to break down all of the different types of biological molecules. They're going to be stored within these granules. And again, the body wants to be as efficient as possible. We don't want to waste our enzymes when we don't have materials to be digested. And so we're going to have enteroendocrine cells that are essentially sitting within the wall of the small intestine. And when the small intestine starts to receive materials from the stomach, these enteroendocrine cells are going to release cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin, CCK, is going to be an example of a hormone that's going to circulate through the body, indicating that we have materials to be digested within the small intestine. And it's going to trigger these pancreatic acids in our cells to release their digestive enzymes so that we're releasing the enzymes that are being delivered to the duodenum so that they can be mixed with the materials that need to be digested. In addition to the pancreatic acid in our cells, we're also going to have some central acid in our cells. Central acid in our cells, central acid in our center of the uh, acid in the center of these little clusters of, of secretory cells. Uh, instead of the basal basophilia of the pancreatic acid in our cells, the uh, cells producing the digestive enzymes, the central acid in our cells are going to have a kind of central condensed nuclei and a relatively clear cytoplasm. And these cells, the central acid in our cells, are going to be producing a watery bicarbonate-rich fluid. And so if we think about the characteristics of a bicarbonate, uh, it has the ability to buffer uh, materials. And so what we have then is the central acid in our cells are essentially releasing a buffer. They're going to be releasing something that's going to go through, mix with the highly acidic materials coming out of the stomach, and buffer them bring that acidic pH down to a more neutral pH so that the enzymes that are being released by the pancreas are going to be able to work. And now the central acid in our cells are going to be releasing their secretory product in response to the hormone secretin. In essence, we've got cells that are sitting within the wall of the duodenum, within the wall of the small intestine, that respond to the acidity of the lumen. And so what happens then is if we start to have a lot of acidity within the lumen, again, indicating that materials are coming out of the stomach with a high acid content. These intraendocrine cells, these hormone secreting cells within the small intestine are going to release secretin. Secretin is going to circulate around through the body, stimulate these central acid in our cells to release the buffer. And that buffer then is going to be transported down the duct system, dumped into the duodenum, dumped into the small intestine where it will buffer the acidity of those contents to allow for the enzymes to work. The higher acidity, more secretin released, more bicarbonate being released. And then, so those are the components associated with the exocrine portion of the pancreas. We're also going to talk very briefly about the islets of Langerhans. That's these clusters of pale staining cells, these hormone secreting cells within the pancreas. So it's endocrine, it's hormone secreting, so instead of a duct system, it's going to be very highly vascularized because these are cells that are going to be releasing hormones. They're going to get into the bloodstream and they're going to be able to circulate through the body. Now, if we take a look at these pale cells, it's going to be very difficult to discriminate between the specific types of cells that are going to be present. 
we're just gonna recognize that it's an islet of Langerhans and that these are all hormone secreting cells. With special stains, we can actually go through and identify four, at least four different categories of cells within the islets of Langerhans. We're gonna have alpha cells that release glucagon. Glucagon is gonna have the effect of increasing blood glucose levels. Beta cells are gonna be releasing insulin. Insulin is gonna have an opposite effect of glucagon. It's gonna be decreasing blood glucose levels. So it's gonna stimulate cells to use glucose or to bring glucose in and store it. Uh, delta cells are gonna release the hormone somatostatin. Somatostatin, in essence, inhibits both the alpha and the beta cells. So it modulates the activities of uh, both glucagon and insulin in regulating uh, blood glucose levels. So we don't have these massive fluctuations in, in blood sugar. And then finally, we've got PP cells. The PP cells uh, are pancreatic polypeptide cells, and they're essentially regulating uh, the pancreas secretions uh, in other regions as well, other ways as well. And this finishes up our uh, introduction to the glands associated with the digestive system. So it ends part five of this lecture series. In part six of this lecture series in the digestive system, uh, we're gonna take a look at the liver. Uh, if you have any questions, as always, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thanks, and hopefully come back for uh, our liver lecture.